Yeah, g'day guys. So here we are. Uh, my name's Ed Goschalk and myself and Greg Linzel, we're going to be doing the Tordy Typo uh, ride for dyslexia um, in about four days' time. I'm here with uh, Jack Baker. He's a former student of mine um, and author. We'll call him an author now. And Jay, um, he also uh, has struggled with dyslexia. I almost couldn't say it. Uh, dyslexia. I'm here also with uh, Kelly King uh, from Dyslexia Mid North Coast, and we just want to have a little bit of a chat, relaxed chat with uh, Jack about uh, dyslexia and, and the kind of um, issues he's had to deal with um, throughout his life having dyslexia. Um, and um, basically, just sort of make it nice and relaxed and easy. And uh, so, I'm just going to ask some questions, Jack, and you just you know answer however you. Feel. Yep. But I, I remember uh, meeting Jack, he was about 10 years, 11 years old, year five, year six, primary school. I just moved up to Port Macquarie from Sydney and uh, a bit of casual teaching. And uh, I'll never forget Jack sitting in the front row of that classroom <laughs> and he gave me heaps. Um, mucked around quite a lot in my lessons, um, but I persevered and uh, because I wanted to know uh, what made Jack tick. I knew there was something else going on there. It wasn't just uh, all about being naughty for the sake of being naughty. And it turns out, in the end, we found out that that to be true. Isn't that right, Jack? Yeah. 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 Um, do you have any recollection of uh, what might have been going on there, why you were mucking around so much in class? I I think what it was is if, let's say I was given a worksheet or, or something, um, I just, I couldn't do anything with it. So everyone around me would be working on a worksheet and the teacher would be sitting at their desk or, but, um, but I would just be sitting there doing nothing yeah. because I couldn't do anything with it. So it was just out of boredom and it, she had just boredom. Like, yeah. So was there an issue with asking for help or? Yeah. I, um, Definitely didn't want to ask for help. Definitely felt like some type of like stigma about it. Um, and it just felt, it just felt easier to sit there and maybe talk to the person next to me if they wanted to talk to me. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Okay. So, um, all right. So progressing a few years forward, we then went to high school. And you ran into me again because uh, <laughs> I left the. Uh, I, I've always had an interest in in working with uh, behaviour and um, and uh, supporting kids on a, on a social basis. So I ended up getting some work as a as a I was a behaviour teacher going in and out of schools, and then I eventually got into the tutorial centre, and then uh, which brought me into working at Ace Secondary College, and setting up a few uh, classes there for students that. Um, had extra support needs in class and that's where we met again mm -hmm. all right um we had a bit of a better relationship there then didn't we yeah <laughs> I, would, I would say so yeah. yeah yeah so um what i what i found then at that time was you weren't coming to school that much and we were trying to find a hook to try and get you to come back to school yeah um i could see that you had some some brains in your head okay so we knew that you you could do stuff, especially practical stuff and, and stuff with technology. We got you involved in um, all that uh, computer, computer um, robotics. robotics. Yeah. Okay. We got into the robotics. Once we uh, got you into that robotics, what happened? Tell us a bit about that. Um, the robotics were really, it was really interesting because um, I went from not coming to school a bunch to being there on weekends and um, staying there late to like six o'clock. Um, just doing physical, like practical stuff on the robot we were building, um, but also designing and um, and kind of like engineering it and working with the teachers and the other students. And it just felt, it just felt like there was like a team and we were all trying to build one thing. It was something that I cared about and um, I just felt motivated to learn and, 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 and to come to school because if I didn't come to school, I, I wouldn't be able to work on it. So 
It was just motivation. It gave me motivation. And you wouldn't have seen me if you didn't come to school either. So. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, no, I understand. No, That's what you're yeah. really trying to say. No, but, okay. um, but genuinely, um, having your class and having the relationship we did, um, it it was a motiv motivation. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was like, oh, yeah, I'll go to school because cause I'm, I like it there. You know what I mean? Yeah. Versus going into a classroom where I don't really know the teacher, and the only thing they ever say to me is, have you done that yet? And then I'm like, no, I haven't because because I'm struggling with the work, but I don't tell them that. You know? Yeah, right. So there's a couple of things I got out of that is, is one, relationships, very important mm -hmm. for your learning. But also that dyslexia, it's not about your level of intelligence. No. It's it's obviously a, a difficulty in reading. It, it's something that you need support with. Mm. Something that you uh, still struggle with today you're now 21 yeah. you, you you're an adult um you've also told me many times that you love to read you love yeah the whole literature you you, yeah. you know you went off and you you wanted to do more with your life so you went to TAFE yeah um and you have even now unfortunately I had a copy of your book that you wrote your little novella yeah. that you yeah. wrote and but what happens is people, uh, another teacher from the school, or well, actually school counsellor, found yeah. out I had it the other day oh, and no. said, what, Jack Baker? Can I have it? Can I read it? So I go, yeah. uh, she's reading it at the moment. And I and I, I, uh, I forgot that we were going to be doing this. Yeah. My fault. Yeah. But, um, but anyway, but it, it is a little book. It's, yeah. it's a little bit based on your life, I think, is it? Yeah. 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 Did you want to talk a little bit about it or tell yeah. us about that? Well, um, yeah, so I... Um, I'm very, anything creative I like, I'm very creative. Um, so I started making short films because it it was like the visual medium. So it made a lot of sense for me, uh, especially when I was younger. It's like, oh, I just got a film. I, there's no like reading involved in that, um, at least not for what I was doing. And then I kept doing that and I got a little older and I thought, well, there's bigger stories I want to tell, but I can't film them all because it's not practical. And um, now I always, I don't know, I always like the way books look. Like I'd open it up and always like the idea of a novel. Smell it? Yes, <laughs> the, the glue, the paper, yeah. Um, so I thought, you know what? We've, we've like the technology that like I understand how to use voice to text and text to speech. So I could probably write a book. Um, it would just be like the scripts I'm writing, but a little, a little more, you know, in prose. So I just, um, but I didn't know anything about grammar or about book formatting or structure. I know a little bit about story structure from the films, but so I just started YouTube. Just started consuming as much information as I could about the writing process. And I just like, I fell in love with it. This is, and this is the part that really intrigues me is the way you use the technology. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, some of the things you were doing to me, it just sounded so painstaking for someone who is not uh, dyslexic. I just thought, oh my God, the, it's a real show of resilience that you <laughs> just kept doing it. Yeah. What, yeah. what were some of the other technologies that you used? And then once it would, once it would write out, it wasn't always perfect. The technology has got a lot better. Yeah. But um, then I would use... Then I'd use text to speech to check the to check it to make sure I knew what it said was correct. And then it, and there was always a, a couple errors. So then I'd go back in and I'd re say the word. And it was like it was slow, but it was like the only way I could write. So yeah, so I did it. And you said that you like you you love reading. Yeah. So in terms of um, your reading, do you use the technologies to yeah. to um, access literature mm. and the books that you like to read? And so how does that work for you? So when I started writing my first novella, I thought I should probably read a book. <laughs> it might be good. And I thought it would be like me trying to make a movie and never watched the movie before. Sure. And I thought, yeah, okay. So I was like, well, I've always heard of Audible. I've yep. always heard about that. So I got an Audible account and I started to listen to books. And then I I also fell in love with that and I started getting a lot of audio books. So audio books, um, massive one for me. Um, but And something I realized is in the process of writing 
writing my first novella, I I learned so much about um, spelling, literacy, grammar. Grammar was a massive one. And I, I just learned a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff I took away from that. And um, just having like so much to do with writing and reading pretty much every day made a massive difference. Yeah. And the fact that I was keeping myself accountable, I didn't have to do it. Um, and, and no one cared if I did it or didn't do it. It was just something I... The thing to... that I find funny is that you make it harder for yourself because you started writing another book. You've set yourself, yeah. you told me, four years to write this yeah. next book. But then, of course, one of your characters is a singer-songwriter. Yeah. So now you've yeah. told me you've got to write the songs. <laughs> yeah. To go with the soundtrack. Definitely. Yeah, so, it's going to be an original soundtrack. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. 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 And you mentioned something then that, um, that a lot of people talk about is the assistive technology... Um, and how that's such a game changer mm. in terms of accessing literature and mm. accessing uh, reading. And um, and so quite often we talk about that, um, you know, in schools, um, that, that that technology is now available um, and it's not really about cheating. So we're still yeah. trying to get around the fact that the HSC is paper. Yeah. You know, how can we tap into the technology so that, um, so that students have access mm. to the knowledge and the learning and um, and levelling that playing field. Yeah. They're not giving an unfair advantage, but just levelling the playing field yeah. by using those technologies. So um, it's great to see that it's been able to um, yeah. not even just expose you to the literature, but as you said, you've learnt so yeah. much by having access and that's really important. I, wouldn't, I would not have been able to write the book without that technology yep. and the act of writing the book improved my literacy. I got better at being able to read things myself and spell things by writing the book, which I would not have been yep. able to do about. Yep. But that's excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So one, one impacts the other um, exactly, and it's yeah. not, it's not about um, cheating or, or making you lazy in any way. Mm. In actual fact, it enhanced your skills, which is and, amazing. And, as far as like writing goes, as from like a story perspective or an author, I don't think you'll find many people that would call it cheating. The story is coming from you. Yep. It doesn't matter if you type it on a keyboard or say it out loud. The story yep. is still the story. And that's that's what I was uh, telling a friend the other day, the one that I lent the book to, was that, you know, um, and you and I have discussed this, so I'm not saying anything out of out of school here. I said, yeah. you can tell when you read that first one that you did that yeah. you have got dyslexia, right? Yeah. You, can, you can see there's certain things in the structure, and we talked about that and how I've, where I've offered to sort of uh, sit with you and go through it and yeah. seeing how we can improve things. But to me, that was the beauty of it because you, you could see, yes, you have dyslexia, but you can see beyond that is your creativity mm. in that story mm. that, that you brought to that to the page mm. and and you were actually able to tell a story mm. so um to me that that's that's the important side of it so if, if we if we then reel back to high school again when you started actually um getting some support you told me a bit about um your experiences with the, the teacher at mm. high school and and she's still there now yeah and mrs ferret yes yeah and and you spoke pretty fondly about some of the stuff you guys did so how uh, is there anything you can tell us about? What, yeah, what the definitely. what were the best parts of that that helped you? Yeah, so um, I started to do like one on one tutoring. Yep, um, and that that replaced my English. So when I was meant to be in English, I would go into a separate empty classroom uh, with her, and we started with Cat in the Hat. That was the book, and. We would open it up, first page, there would only be a few words on the page, and we would just like read through it. And it could take as long as I needed to. There was literally no time limit. And I think, we'd, so if I would read a page, which would be very slow, and I'd get stuck on words, and, and she would help me out. And then, um, and then once I finished that page, she would read the next page. And then we did that. Um, and it would take a long time, and but we did it every day, um, and then eventually I could read the whole book, read yeah. the whole cat in the hat in one session, straight for it. Yeah. And um, and, and I used to complain the entire time. <laughs> like 
I'd be like, oh, I don't want to be, I don't want to do this, I don't want to do this. Now, like, looking back, I feel bad. It's like she had to sit in that room and deal with me complaining. But just the patience, you know? Well, she still smiles when I talk about you. So that's yeah. okay. <laughs> she was patient. She's, strong with all that. she's yeah. patient and she dealt with the whinging, you know what I mean? Because I, I really didn't want to do it. And now, I, what year were you in at school then? Um, not sure. Between year eight, I think. Yeah, yeah, I'd say year eight. Yeah. 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 So how important do you think it is um, in terms of year eight? And I guess there's a lot of students that wouldn't even entertain the idea of going into a separate classroom and having one-on-one tutoring um, once they get to year eight because yeah. they're 13, 14 years of age. So I guess... Um, hats off to you because um, you were you were willing and open to um, wanting to learn um, well, yeah. even after many yeah. many years yeah. obviously of, of really challenging and struggling times. Mm-hmm. So how important or, or, or do you think it would have been for you if you'd been able to access that when you were in year one, year two, or, or in primary school? Yeah, I think it would have been a, like a game changer. I think if if what I did. Um, if what I did in year eight, I did earlier Mm -hmm. or I had that offered to me, I, I, I think my reading would have improved a lot sooner. Great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Without a doubt. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So patience and intensity, I think. (laughs) We've got out of that one. Yeah. 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 And and tenacity. You've had the, you know, really dedicated to, um, that end game, uh, um, to see where you are now and, um, yeah. And congratulations and well done to you that you've you've achieved everything that you've achieved. Because, Thank you. Yeah. Um, you know, against some some incredible odds. Yeah. Yeah, it is a challenge. And since I've been doing the training um, for for this ride, um, and people sort of see me with all the bags on my bike and riding around like a crazy man, <laughs> and uh, and then they ask why why <laughs> you know, and then i talk about the dyslexia and and okay. it's amazing how many people are coming forward and saying oh my child had dyslexia and they just didn't know what to do with him or her or oh, i had dyslexia one guy um pulled me over on the side of the road to to ask him for some help with his truck when i was riding through Vega, and we started talking he's going well, what are you doing on the bike as they all say and, mm-hmm. and i told him about dyslexia and he said oh yeah i I had dyslexia and when I was about 13, I basically dropped out of school and, and then I got a job and he said, and he was quite articulate. He was, he was very clever. He, he's running his own trucking business now and all those sorts of things. And he, and he was talking about how he'd love to work with kids and put back in, you know, and all that sort of stuff. So um, it just goes to show that, that it, it's a, a lot of it out there that um, we don't realise and, and in a lot of ways we don't deal with it as well as we could. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, it definitely is the most common learning difficulty, um, and um, and we certainly um, have made great progress and strides in the last few years um, in terms of our um, education uh, curriculum, particularly here in New South Wales. Um, so, getting our teachers trained um, and upskilling them in um, in the way our brains learn to read, um, because if we can teach, well, we all learn to read the same way. So teaching children the way children with dyslexia learn to read actually benefits all students. Yeah. Um, so, and, and the new curriculum supports that, mm-hmm. which is which is fabulous because it means that we will identify children a lot younger yeah. um, and less children will slip through the net um, yeah. in terms of, of learning to read and not, you know, getting to high school and still struggling to mm-hmm. learn um, basic basic books yeah um, and and on that really um roughly how much uh does it cost to because you were talking about scholarships for teachers to yeah. to get teachers trained up which is a great idea I, I think you know we need we need that support um so we're raising this money now so just so we've got an idea like how much would it cost to say put one teacher through the scholarship so for the last five years we've um partnered with spelled new south wales Um, and Mm. they've been in operation, they're a not-for-profit in terms of supporting parents, children and teachers with specific learning difficulties. Uh, So they've been going for 50 years and we've partnered with them over the last five years and uh, we're now part of their regional outreach program. So so this year they've been here twice um, and as part of, it depends on the training 
um, in terms of the teacher scholarship. So yeah. the first part of this year in April, um, we had two teachers that attended uh, Sounds Right training, um, and that is $900 per teacher um, to go through that four-day workshop. But that does equip a teacher to teach all children in terms of what the evidence tells us in how to learn to read in systematic synthetic phonics instruction. Yeah. And so um, so a teacher can walk away from that and take that back to the classroom, which is really important, and they can share that knowledge as well. And um, and so we had two teachers go through that with us this year. And then yeah. Sveld came back a second time, and they actually ran workshops, full-day workshops that are aligned and NESA accredited um, with the new curriculum. And some of those workshops were only a few hundred dollars. So again, it just depends on what the training is. Some of the scholarships or um, some of the training that we've done with teachers have cost us $3,000 per teacher um, yeah. in multi-sensory structured literacy instruction. So yeah. Um, so yes, yeah, so we've actually um, had, I think it's seven teachers now that we've put through various training and most definitely the fundraising that's happening with Ride for Dyslexia will be amazing in terms of us being able to um, do that again next year um, yep. when Spelled comes and, and put even more teachers through um, so that, yes, we can get that filtering out into our education and schools here locally. Um, and we've certainly got um, a lot of speech pathologists and occupational therapists and that type of thing also doing that training. So there's lots of advantages um, in having that training come to the region as well um, yep. because it takes the expense away from having to travel to Sydney or Gold Coast to actually attend those types of training. Yeah, okay, that's excellent. Mm. All right, well, um, I think that probably wraps it up. It's just just wanted to put a bit of a spotlight on um, someone who's real, who's who's dealt with dyslexia, and seeing you know the the resilience that you can have, and if and and just really highlighting the fact that um, dyslexia is not about saying somebody's you know has low intelligence or anything like that. It's 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 obviously something um, that uh, people have that we can support and if it's treated the right way, um, you know, we, we can have a very fruitful life. Um, it's also really important forward. for the kids that are currently at school and struggling to see that there is on the other side yeah, um, yeah. opportunities and successes that, um, you know, regardless of how much you've struggled through school, um, that is a short window um, in, in terms of, you know, in your lifetime, um, and there's most definitely opportunities outside that to um, to achieve and be so successful. A, a great ambassador role here, yeah. Jack. <laughs> I, I did I did take him into the school a little while back and yeah. showed his book around a few of the teachers, and some of the teachers actually said, "Would you come in and talk to our students and yep. just let them know that you can struggle, but you can get there." Yeah, and you know, um, Greg and Ed are pedaling 120 kilometres to raise awareness and funds so that we can um, support more people like Jack. 820. 820, what did yeah, I say? 120. Oh, 800. You've got to say, oh, boy, oh. they've cut it back. Excellent. <laughs> 820 kilometres. Um, like, can I tell you, it's actually, it's actually, it's, I think it's, it's actually climbing higher than that because we've had to make a few um, other extra um detours because of, for certain reasons, and it's getting closer probably to the 850. And... I'm just looking at. We've been looking at the weather and the and the fires popping up everywhere. So we're going. Oh, we might have to take some different turns here and there. So it could be a bit longer. I don't know. Could be a bit longer. Well, <laughs> but anyway. we, well, we hope that the Port Macquarie community will come and um, cheer you across that finish line at Telstra University on the 15th of October. Um, we'll certainly have plenty of um, activities going on, um, and Telstra will be going red for dyslexia. Um, that night as well. It's a free community event. So I hope everyone will come along and, and um, cheer you on and thank you for what you're doing um, for Dyslexia Big North Coast and for um, the students in our community. No problem, man. I'm just glad that uh, Daylight Savings has kicked in because I realised that actually we've got a bit more daylight to get, <laughs> to get in on time because I was starting to think uh, the last couple of weeks ago, I was thinking, oh, it's going to be a bit dark by the time we get in at six o'clock. But anyway, it's going to be all right now. Yeah, no, it's not until about 7.30. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, all right. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, viewers. <laughs>